Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. And welcome to today's webinar on upcoming changes to the commercial and rooftop splits, part of the Designer Air series. Your first speaker today is Mike Oakley, a marketing manager at Commercial. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Oakley. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so today, we'll be discussing uh, commercial rooftops and split systems, and, you know, we'll be talking through spooky things, such as regulations. That, that went better in my head. But I'll introduce myself, Michael Oakley. I'm a market manager with commercial air conditioning, uh, responsible primarily for uh, compressors that go into uh, rooftops and split systems. And I'm joined here today by Jason Warner, and he is one of our scroll engineering managers uh, in air conditioning. Um, and together, I would say over the last, what is it, 18, 24 months, we've been working pretty vigorously to handle uh, what are these upcoming changes to commercial rooftops and splits. So before we dive into the content, um, just a couple thoughts here. I want to say, you know, hang on through the end of the presentation. You know, there might be a special trick or a treat. Um, and then also keep in mind as we go through, you guys are free to submit questions or comments uh, throughout. You know, we have some behind the, the scenes folks and, and the folks at WebEx to help us here. Um, but uh, we'll handle the key Q&A, you know, for, say, we'll save that for the end. Okay? Anything before we move on? So we'll dive into the key factors that are influencing the U.S. commercial air conditioning market. So as Emerson, you know, we're tracking some key mega trends. You know, the first primarily is the theme of building automation and connectivity. Uh, another mega trend would be comfort and air quality. And then finally, energy efficiency and sustainability. And you can see the various responses uh, Emerson is taking as a business to address these key mega trends. But basically, the bulk of today's discussion, we're going to focus on that last item in, in terms of trends, which is the energy efficiency and sustainability element. Uh, we'll talk through modulation. We'll talk about talk through commercial systems. Uh, and we'll talk through what's going on to uh, basically address what are new regulations uh, associated with energy efficiency. So just to get uh, started and to have some engagement, uh, as of January 1 of 2018, the Department of Energy has some new regulations coming up associated with light commercial rooftops and split systems. Um, uh, take some time as the audience to fill this out on to, as to your degree of awareness from I've never heard of this before to yes, I've heard of this, but I'm here to learn more basically. While we're waiting, you know, we tapped into our database of, uh, you know, contractors and technicians, you know, and other channel players to basically ask the same question. And what we found was, you know, there's pretty decent awareness of, yes, there's an efficiency standard, but, you know, there's some uncertainty as to exactly what that means. And then also, uh, there's still a pretty substantial population that just wasn't aware at all, which, um, you know, with some upcoming changes in, what is it now? two months, or it'll be two months tomorrow, um, you know, that could be pretty influential. And we're going to talk through that today. Um, like I said, it's not as scary as you would think, you know, for being a Halloween webinar, but uh, uh, there certainly are some changes that are coming. So in terms of um, what exactly is going on in the commercial market, uh, the way that I like to describe the efficiency regulations that are upcoming is basically in the chart that you see presented here. And the way that works is on the y-axis, you've got IEER, which is a metric of efficiency. And then on the x-axis on the bottom, you have what would be the system tonnage of a commercial rooftop or potentially a commercial split system. So basically what's going on with this regulation is the green line is where we're at today, okay? So OEMs today cannot manufacture equipment that is not compliant with that level or that regulatory level, okay? But as of January 1, 2018, 
a new round of regulations will increase that minimum efficiency level. Now you can see it's kind of tiered and it's different levels for different, different system tonnages. But for example, if you've got a seven or, or a seven and a half ton rooftop, as of January 1, uh, you would have gone from 11.4 IER requirement now to a 12.9 IER requirement. Similarly, if you have uh, like a 20 ton rooftop roughly, or you know, 15 ton rooftop, you go from 11.2 to about 12.4. Now that's the 2018 regulation. You know, the thing that's been um, especially interesting about this regulation is the way it was drafted. It was drafted in two waves. So there's a regulation that comes um, in January. That's the red line, and then there's a follow-on regulation for further efficiency levels that comes in 2023. So you can see green is where we're at today. Red is where we'll be in January, and then shortly thereafter, you know, it it, it doesn't stop or it never ends. We'll, we'll be at the 2023 levels uh, in just a matter of uh, four or five years, which for this type of equipment, that's a pretty quick turnaround in terms of, you know, the efficiency. So the way that this kind of works for these and, and the way that it's enforced and the way that as you guys are down channel, you might ha have some, you know, impact to you is that um, the OEMs themselves are not allowed to manufacture equipment that's not compliant. So you'll see as of January 1, 2018, what was um, or what would be turning into non-compliant equipment is going to slowly phase out in the coming months, and then OEMs will begin producing the new equipment uh, that is then compliant with the regulation. So let's um, let's turn to the let's turn to the, the polling result. Looks like we have some results. Can they see that result? So it looks like we have some some general. Uh, thoughts here relative to awareness, uh, pretty similar to what we saw in our, our broader database, right? About 25, 26% of people, just no awareness. Um, additional, um, you know, some people are aware of the efficiency and so on and so forth. I'm moving my screen so I can see that question in more detail. I don't know about you guys, but basically um, some awareness, but uh, don't see as much of a, as much of a threat, but uh, not necessarily uh, a risk or a threat. So that's good, and we're, we're here to learn a little bit more. Hey, Mike. Um, so how do you anticipate that these regulations are going to affect the OEM strategies? Great question. So the first thing that I would say, and uh, take us to the next chart if you don't mind, Lindsay. So the first thing that I would say is the OEMs, they have a, a tiering strategy. And um, the as you can see, I took that chart from the last one and just basically took what it was a typical OEM profile and laid it over. And uh, you can see they've got some smaller rooftop equipment, they've got some high efficiency equipment, and they've got some low efficiency, lower efficiency equipment. Um, but as soon as uh, the 2018 regulation comes into play, you see immediately that there are some systems, take that orange box there, they're not compliant. That system has been getting worked. Those systems have been getting worked. Uh, not every um, system, maybe in that lineup, required work to bring it up to level or bring it up to spec, but a lot of them did. Now, as a byproduct of bringing that one up to spec, to your question, Jason, basically that means all these tiers start, you know, bunching up. The the yellows running into the green, and then there's not as much differentiation between the two. So. First thing is you might start to see some rationalization going forward in the future. You see some initial tiering that is setting up, you know, the game for um, compliance, but then now you've kind of got belts and suspenders and products in the same places, so you'll see that cleaned up. And then also the next area that will be of great inter interest is really uh, some of this bigger rooftop equipment. Um, you have some of that stuff that's in, you know, constant air volume versus stage air volume in that applied equipment. And that stuff is, um, uh, is, is going to get worked, and those designs will open again as well, probably with the mindset of trying to get above the, the 2018 and beyond the 2023. So rationalization of the product line plus also some stretch goals relative to 2023 is likely what's next. So that leads us to another poll, which I would say is 
you know, all the following, what best uh, describes the impact new efficiency regulation might have on your business? You know, from I don't care about it, not at all, to, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it challenging for me to compete, to, you know what, what an opportunity for me now that there's new tiers and new equipment, uh, I'm going to be able to move product I couldn't quite move before, to there could be other, I'm not, maybe I'm not sure what to make of it. Let's see what you guys think. So while we're waiting on that, you know, we've had all this, all this talk about IEER, okay? So we thought it would be influential between Jason and I to start putting together a packet of, you know, what exactly is IEER, okay? How do you calculate it? Um, what do you use it for? How, how, does, how does this stuff get made? And uh, you'll see how this ties together because it influences how we prepare for regulation, how our customers, which would be OEMs, prepare for regulations, uh, and so on and so forth. So what you're looking at here, here is uh, just a basic description of how IER is calculated. Now you'll see over the next few charts, the way that we laid this out is um, simply, you know, if you are a deeply technical person, you know, it's, gonna, it, it's not going to be enough. You're going to want to learn more. You're going to want to keep digging. Uh, but we'll scratch the surface. If you are not a technical person, we're not going to swamp you. You're, you're going to feel like, wow, I know a lot more about IER, but, uh, you know, just, just a little bit more and I would have been lost. So we're going to try th to thread that needle and, and maintain the balance here as we describe this. So bear with us. So IER in and of itself is a weighted average calculation. Um, and so if you look at the table there, there are four key points that are meant to represent uh, four different net capacities of the system. And each one gets a weighting score associated with it. So for example, you know, it's, it's pretty rare that a system is totally loaded. And so that really only accounts for about 2% of the actual runtime. Whereas the 75 and the 50% point, you know, really make up the, the bulk, the 80 some odd percent of the actual runtime with, in this case of the IER calculation, quite a bit more. If we were talking about chillers, this would be a different rating. If we were talking about uh, like residential systems or SEER rated equipment below six ton, we'd have a different answer, but uh, we're talking about rooftops. So the name of the game there is IER. So the equation there basically is pretty straightforward, and you're just looking at, you know, how do you take the, the efficiency from uh, point A and multiply that by its weighting and sum it up with the other rating point. Now, if only it was so simple. Okay, so if I can't exactly hit all those points, there are adjustments to the calculation. And a couple of adjustments would go as follows, okay? So I'm running at that point. I can fully run at that point. The compressor in the system is there. That's what you would call a direct utilization of that point. Now, in instances where maybe I can't unload or I can't unload to be directly running at, say, the 75% or the 50% point, there are other calculation methods such as interpolation or degradation, and we'll talk into that a little bit more detail, that go into the calculus of IER that drives what is this system efficiency rating. So, Mike, another question for you. Uh, why are we seeing all these regulations move towards like a weighted average scenario? You know, that's a really good question. You know, in the, in the beginning, we were talking a lot about, you know, full load rated equipment, EER type stuff. And, you know, EER by itself as a full load is pretty advantageous to, you know, a utility maybe that it's you know, trying to manage its peak loading and so on and so forth. But IER and SEER and some of these other seasonal weighted averages, you know, they're good uh, from the standpoint as, as you go down the channel a little bit more to contractors and others um, and even end users, it's a lot more representative of what's actually going on in the system and how that is actually consuming energy. You know, I, I think I like IER. 
You know, I think it's done good things. I think seasonal weighted averages are good. I don't know that I like I E E R as much as I like B E E R. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so take take us through to the next one. So this is similar information, but laid out in a slightly different way. And what I try to articulate here is simply um, if I have a compressor, let's say I have a system and it's a single compressor, uh, how might that run and how might that impact the rating system? So, for example, on my y-axis, I've got the capacity or the load of the system. On my x-axis, I've got what is the outdoor temperature, and I've got two key lines there. The blue one would be the compressor capacity that I can deliver. Now, you see, as it gets hotter and hotter, as the temperature increases, the capacity of the system actually tends to de decrease. The avail ability to reject heat uh, degrades a little bit with that. Uh, in contrast, the load is ever increasing. You think about hotter and hotter, you know, I, I know, you know, you think about your car on a hot day, right? The more sunlight you get or the hotter it is outside, the hotter that oven temperature gets. Your load is increasing. So, um, in the context of the A, B, C, and D points for IEER, the system is sized for that A point. So you can directly use that A point. Now, we're talking about a fixed capacity compressor here. So what that means is that compressor cannot unload. So to hit the B point, to hit the C point, and the D point, you've got to take the, the compressor at that condition and then degrade its value, which is an adjustment to the calculation. Now, very similar in setup, but this is a system where, in fact, I've got more than one mechanical cooling stage, okay? So you'll see that I added an additional blue line for the individual compressor capacity. Now, in between the C and the B point, you see, you'll notice that we're using an interpolation, okay? That's a different utilization of a, of a calculation uh, that's more advantageous for that particular type of question. So this is where technically we get very quickly above my pay grade. So once again, I got Jason here, and, and the thing that I'm hoping you can help the audience understand here, Jason, is when we're talking about direct, when we're talking about interpolation and degradation as calculation, what, is, what does that mean in the system and help, help these people visualize it? Sure. So I'll start with degradation there. Um, so if, you, if you're trying to achieve a system capacity that's really lower than your compressor can run, um, the, the system's going to be switching the compressor on and off. Um, so during that cycling, you get, um, it's really a penalty. Um, you, you have time that the compressor's got to run to achieve uh, pressures, get your condenser and evaporator where you need them to be. So you're, you're spending energy there where you're not really doing a whole lot of cooling. Um, plus the, the startup current. So there, there's a penalty there that's uh, calculated out, and we call that degradation. As far as the interpolation goes, um, it takes you back to junior high math class. You can run above and below those points, um, so your compressor is really cycling back and forth from either high stage to low stage on the same compressor, or um, you know if you have a, two or three compressors in a system, it's one of them turning on and off. Um, so you're allowed to interpolate the efficiency of those two points and kind of average it out. So then if we flip over to the next slide. Um, so what we, we laid here, um, if you have a, a, uh, a system that's got uh, one of our Copeland two-stage compressors in it, what we've done is we've designed these compressors such that uh, you still hit the full load capacity um, but our low stage compa capacity of the compressor will line up pretty darn close with that B point there, which happens to be the highest weighting point. Um, so you're no longer penalized at that, that B point, and your degradation is also lower for the C and the D point. And so with a simple compressor swap in the system, um, you, can, you can then hit that 62% weighting point, that B point there, and you get a big bump in your IEER with a pretty easy swap out. Mike? So, Jason, I'm just reacting to the poll that we're looking at here. Um, 
you know, a lot of what you're saying here uh, correlates directly to what is some of the interest here, and I wanted to call that out. A lot of people looking for this as an opportunity to, to, to upsell, as were we several years ago when we identified this and our understanding of the calculation. Um, so that that basically means that good things are coming. That's right. That's right. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty easy swap to get the this compressor on there. The the circuitry is pretty easy. Uh, an additional twenty four volt uh, solenoid coil, um, and you can you can pick up a lot of IEER. Um, in many cases, bump your system up pretty easily to meet the minimum requirements now. So if we look at the sort of the math behind this, um, so on the left side there. I've got a just a, a simulation, a mathematical simulation of a system with a fixed capacity compressor. Um, and you can see we've laid out the four uh, points there in the bottom, A, B, C, and D, 100% down to 25%. And we've kind of shown you the math of what the, the system efficiency is at each of those points. And you'll notice that uh, in the three that are marked degradation, um, you, you have a decent uh, compressor or system efficiency to start out with, but then you degrade it down to at the 75% point, you take a system that runs about 12.9 and the cycling penalty takes you down to 12.1. Um, and that's just a kind of a, you know, a big penalty on the system efficiency there. Contrast that with the right side of the screen there where we just drop in a Copeland two-stage compressor. Um, we're hitting direct to, uh, ratings at the 100% and the 75%. Um, we still degrade a little bit on the, the 50 and 25%, but not nearly as much as before. And we pick up, in this example, about 14% efficiency just by swapping out the compressor. So we've kept the, you know, all the condenser and evaporator the same, the fans the same, and uh, just added in that extra stage of cooling capacity. So Jason, as we look at this sort of analysis, you know, also talk to, you know, how would this look a little bit different from a two-stage as opposed to just putting in two smaller fixed-capacity compressors in there? Yep, you could do that, and then you kind of got to weigh your options. There's a, a ton of flexibility when you look at uh, multiple compressors um, of how you hit those different weighting points. Um, you, there's a good opportunity. You could probably... Uh, if you mix and match compressor sizes a little bit, you could probably bump that up and, you know, hit the 50% also directly and get rid of that degradation. Bump your IE up there, IEER up there. Um, the kind of the trade-offs you got to look out for are the size of the system. Can you actually fit two compressors in? Um, with two, you got a little extra tubing cost to go in there and, and work all the piping in. Um, so there's definitely options there. Um, you know, as, you, as if you were designing a new system or an OEM, you definitely got to look at that too. So here we've, we've just kind of uh, drawn up a, a little schematic. If you look at the, the light blue bar there at the bottom of the screen, you know, today's the minimum efficiency for a, a seven and a half ton system, for example, uh, around 11.4 IEER. Um, our simulations are showing, you know, if you drop in this with the two-stage compressor, uh, you can bump that up and you should be able to hit the new 2018 regulation pretty easily. Um, and it sets you up very nicely for the, the EL3, which is the 2023 regulation impending pretty soon, um, to just drop in maybe some uh, indoor fans, different indoor fans, variable speed there. Two, two speed fan, something like that, and you should be positioned pretty nicely for that um, impending regulation. So next I'm going to walk you through just a quick detail on the on the compressor itself, how we achieve this extra stage of capacity. So what I've got here is a sort of a split cross section. On the left side, you see the cross section is in full in full load or high stage mode. On the right side, it's in the low stage mode. And the key difference being that uh, gray ring there in the center of the screen moves up and down. Um, and on the left side, when it's in high stage mode, we've got that ring down, sealing some vent holes. Um, 
So the the scroll mechanisms are running just as a standard fixed speed compressor would run. And with a with a switch of a 24 volt coil, the solenoid will lift that gray ring up, exposing those vent holes, and you actually bypass the outer portion of the scroll, uh, which sort of delays the uh, the onset of compression and, and reduces your capacity. So I've got a, a little graphic here on the next slide to show you that. So in high stage, um, the way a scroll compressor works, you're sucking in the suction gas from the outside there, and then the scroll members compress it towards the center and discharge out. And with our Copeland two stage, um, those vent holes actually delay the, the suction seal off until, you know, you're in, uh, in the wrap part way. So you've actually decreased the size of that red circle there, sign signifying the displacement of the compressor. So we using the same, same scroll members, um, and just, we've reduced the capacity of the compressor there, reduced the load on all the bearings in the motor and, uh, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Very good, very good, Jason, and thank you, thank you for the overview on that great technology. Um, as I talk through the solution portfolio, it, once again, you're going to start seeing that six to ten horsepower two-stage product coming out uh, in anticipation of the regulation, uh, and that's going to drive into uh, new commercial equipment. So take us. So we pulled, um, once again, you know, our database of, of customers, contractors, and cha channel participants about the various types of technologies that we have, especially uh, with regard to different modulation technologies. So the top bar here is familiarity with uh, variable speed scroll compressors. Uh, the bottom would be our two-stage compressors. And you see, yeah, I mean, about 50% has a degree of familiarity uh, on the high end. But also, you know, there's, you know, only about 50% uh, on the flip side is not that familiar with it. So one of the biggest questions that I always get, and I try to summarize that here, you know, whether I'm talking with contractors or OEMs or, or whomever is, you know, how, how are you going to deliver capacity modulation at the system level, you know, via compression? So what I like to do is I like to lay out simply just the rest of the portfolio that Emerson offers. You know, we've been talking about, you know, various technologies here, but, you know, especially if we look at that poll and we think about it in the context of the opportunity to upsell and the equipment that might be available, you know, we first start and we say, you know, look, for fixed capacity compressors, uh, we have a broad offering from zero to 40 horsepower on this chart. We've actually got a 60 ton compressor too, but, you know, that one's off the chart in an individual capacity. Um, we've got digital compressors. We've got variable speed compressors. We've got um, compressors that are induction motors that we can add modulation to uh, by adding a drive. Uh, we have our two-stage compressors that we're adding uh, and growing up now to 10 horsepower to meet the commercial need. And then finally, whenever there is a gap, then you've got multiples and multiple compressors manifolded together. And, you know, a combination of these, you know, don't think about a multiple as it's only fixed capacity compressors. We do multiples with uh, fixed capacitors and uh, fixed compressors and variable speed. Uh, we do uh, multiples with uh, you know two stage compressors with digital compressors and all the like. And you know if you can imagine it, we have a way to deliver basically that capacity and modulation in Emerson compression portfolio via scroll. So just to say kind of a, in a different way, and as a quick cheat sheet, because, uh, you know, not all applications are created the same. Um, so the way that I like to think about it is, you know, fixed capacity uh, compressors are great. They have their application. Um, but as you go into, say, smaller tonnage systems and you want capacity modulation, it's hard to put a tandem into, say, a seven and a half ton rooftop. Um, so an easy way to do that and an easy way to deliver an affordable uh, regulatory satisfactory product coming up is with the two-stage. So with that extra step of capacity that Jason just showed that you're hitting that 75% point, you're hitting all the IER levels, um, you're doing that with a two-stage compressor. 
digital compressors, very, very great for precision cooling. Um, they can very finely in a low complexity way, lower, I would say lower complexity than say a variable speed, control the environment. You see those uh, in precision cooling applications and data centers and the like, or anywhere where there might be an interest to um, have finer cooling control. And then there's variable speed compressors. You see these on the high end where you're trying to get every bit of efficiency out as you can. Now I would say our fixed capacity and our two-stage compressors are very efficient as well. Um, so it really, at the end of the day, will come down to system design. Um, I want to say off the top of my head, you would think that the variable speed compressors are all the highest rated IER equipment, but that's not necessarily the case. I think the highest rated IER equipment today, correct me if I'm it's very close, is actually uh, two two-stage compressors. I think that's right, Michael. Yeah. Um, so sometimes a little bit counterintuitive, but depending on how those work and how the calculation works and, and uh, how this, all this equipment gets put together, um, that can uh, have a pretty good influence on that. Um, and then finally, obviously, there is a, a place for multiples. Um, you see those in larger equipment and the like. And like I said, if you can dream it, uh, we're thinking about it too and thinking about ways that we can manifold those together. So um, at the beginning, I said there was a trick or a treat. You fooled. I tricked you. There is no treat. <laughs> Kidding. But there's no treat. Um, but the treat is knowledge. Okay, knowledge in the fact that the, the efficiency regulations are coming up. You know, we learned a lot about IER. Now we know about all the various ways to address IER, different ways to modulate, different ways to manage complexity. You know, if it's under the sun, there's probably a good way um, to design a system that way. And Emerson uh, offers kind of the, the, the portfolio that'll help you get there no matter what your design goals are or your goals are for that particular application and equipment. So with that, we will begin to open this up for some Q&A. So we're going to start opening this up so that we can start hearing some questions coming in. So uh, please, if you have, have a question, uh, begin to submit those, and we will begin to uh, take those through. Okay, here's a here's a good one. First question, uh, and this one's for you, Jason. When would you want to use uh, multiples instead of two stage or variable speed? Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. Uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit ago. Um, there, there's really a couple factors you got to think about. Um, you know, size constraint being one of them. You know, can you fit? two or three compressors in a system skid, or you know, do you have to go with one? Um, that's one, the, the complexity of the, the controller may be another one. Can you control two compressors? Um, the, the beautiful part of the this Copeland two stage is that uh, a lot of um, thermostats are designed for two stages and you can just uh, use that to control the, the solenoid. Uh, so you've got to look at that. Well, Will two stages give you enough efficiency? You know, are are you doing the sort of a base tier to meet these um, new IEER minimums, or are you trying to um, you know tier up and have a, a really high efficiency system? Um, to your point a little bit ago, I think the the highest IEER system I've heard of I think does use two two stage compressors instead of a variable speed. Um, you can get uh, just a pretty incredible combination of, of capacity steps with two two-stage compressors. Um, so there's a lot of options you got to think through there. You know the size constraints, the the complexity of it. Um, you know there's a there's a cost impact too of doing multiples with the extra tubing. So a couple things to think about. Every application is going to be different, like you said. So good, good. <laughs> So it looks like we got another question in here, uh, and the question is, how long do manufacturers have to deplete existing inventory? This is a real good question, and this is kind of always at the crux of, of regulation. But uh, basically, the regulation 
um, is on when OEMs can manufacture equipment. So, for example, there's not really a quota on when OEMs have to deplete the equipment, but uh, as of January 1, they can no longer make non-compliant equipment. So, for example, if um, you were so inclined and had lots of money, technically you could probably buy, although I wouldn't advise this, but theoretically, as, as far as I understand the regulation, uh, you could stockpile rooftops and they would still technically be sellable. Um, that's a lot of space, though. So with the next question, oh, we got another question. Oh, this one's a good one. So um, the question today, and I'll answer this one too, um, today was all about efficiency regulations. What's going on with refrigerants and the commercial market? Whoa, is it, that is a loaded question, and that's, uh, that's probably a whole other webinar in itself, but I will try to give you the flyover. Okay, so uh, first off I wanna say is there is no pending regulation uh, with regard to refrigerants on uh, commercial rooftops or splits that we know of today. Okay, now the state in the U.S. and Chillers is a little bit different, and, and I'll go into that, but the way that I like to think about this is uh, I kind of go back and I, I think about it from the history standpoint, um, and that's with regard to, um, you know, back in the 80s, we had the Montreal Protocol, and uh, we had this, old, uh, this hole in the ozone layer, and it was, uh, it was a big deal, you know. So uh, countries got together, uh, they formed the Montreal Protocol, and basically it banned sub substances that were HCFCs. Um, namely, those were aerosols, that was R22. Well, when we banned those, we replaced those with chemicals like R410A and uh, R134A in chillers, uh, a handful of other ones in, uh, in, in refrigeration. And uh, it turns out that those have a very high uh, propensity to lead to um, or contribute to global warming on a magnitude of, uh, I want to say, R14A, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but R14A is about 1,800 times the potency of... Yeah, 1,800 some, some, to 2,200, somewhere yeah. in that range, right? times the, um, you know, the potency of CO2, one of the main offenders in refrigeration. Thankfully, we don't have this problem in, in, in uh, AC, but R404A is like 4,000 times as impactful. So um, an amendment was made to address this to the Montreal product protocol called the Kigali Amendment. Uh, 197 countries got together to ratify it, including the United States. Uh, it's a separate deal from uh, the Paris Accord, which you may be familiar with. Um, and basically, it sets the phase-down structure for these refrigerants. So, um, for example, uh, developed nations in the mid-2020s have to have a phase-down of um, a certain percentage, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, and then they have another step down in the 2030s or edging to 2040. Um, and those regulations um, are then dictated by each individual country, of which the U.S. implementation first step is there is a regulation that's on the books today for chillers in 2024 where R410A and R134A are supposed to be delisted and phased out. So that's the commercial connection of what's going on with refrigerants. Now, it gets more complicated than that in that um, those refrigerants um, or that delisting is being challenged as to whether or not the EPA had the authority to make that ruling. So stay tuned. Lots of development going on there. It's as clear as mud. But I can't say there is not a regulation at this time in rooftops. Uh, so that's why we're focusing on the efficiency regulations. I see another one here, Mike. Uh, will demand ventilation be considered to boost efficiency? Um, I'll take a quick stab at that, and you can jump in if yeah. you've got a thought there. But uh, this this standard we're talking about today, the IER, is only based on the system, the uh, the rooftop system itself. You know, the mm -hmm. uh, the small scale system. Not really talking about uh, ventilation needs or total building efficiency. 
a lot of those things would fall under, you know, ash rate 62.1, um, some other aspects of 90.1 and, the, you know, lead building certification type stuff. Um, any other thoughts there to add? No, I mean, I think that's well said. You know, the, you know, the, the bulk of what we talked about relative to the IER, requ uh, IER requirements of the DOE, um, you know, adopted was an adaptation from ASHRAE 90.1. And then, as you said, most of the ventilation stuff comes out of, for example, 62.1, or there could be other indoor air quality stuff coming out of, uh, you know, different standards. So another question we have here, uh, when can contractors expect to see, um, you know, these new larger two-stage compressors? Well, um, so I'll take a stab at that. And then, uh, you know, jump in. I know because we're working kind of the, you know, the expansion of different models and so on from an engineering perspective, Jason. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we are lost for that product uh, now. So we're selling that right now to OEMs, and, and they're, uh, they're building that into equipment in anticipation of uh, January 1, 2018. Now, uh, they're staffing up their pipelines and so on and so forth. But uh, I would imagine that uh, basically – at, near, or maybe even potentially before January of 2018, you're going to start seeing these new um, these new models uh, pop up, uh, if you will, and for, be for sale. Right, right, yeah. So I did see another question here, Mike, about... Um why could a could a customer not just add on a VFD to an existing compressor, uh, fixed speed compressor? Um, that's a, definitely an option. We you know we offer some models that are that are qualified for that. Um, you just you really got to be careful um, doing it in the field. Um, you really need to know if the the compressor's motor and bearings are sized for that. Um, bearings is probably the big one because you can't really look at them. Um, until it's too late. So you really got to make sure, to talk with the, the compressor manufacturer, make sure it's qualified for the speeds you want to run. Um, you'd have to especially watch out if it's a, you know, multiple configuration, more than one compressor in there to, you know, make sure the oil's balanced between the compressors. Um, and then keep an eye on your amperage. Um, changing that, changing the voltage is going to, you know, make some crazy things happen. So um, I definitely, that's always a good option as long as it's, you know, factory tested and certified. Hmm. So I see a good question there on, you know, how, how might, uh, you know, warranty compressors be affected or service compressors be affected? Um, you know, the, the service of the aftermarket is a different animal, um, in that, you know, for example, we still sell our ZR compressors there, you know, which are R22 compressors. Um, now, there's obviously some challenges associated with that, with the fluid and all, all, all that good stuff. Um, but I, I would say this, this regulation is uh, focused on OEM new equipment. Um, and then we, uh, at, from a compressor manufacturer, we, we will continue to offer uh, you know, service parts for the aftermarket. Here's another good one for you, Mike. Any reason a customer would buy a unit that complies with the 2018 regulations, but falls short of the 2023. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so this really comes down to, um, you know, the individual, you know, interests of probably what that end, end user wants. So the key difference between a 2018 equipment and 2023 equipment is going to be efficiency. Um, you know, given that pricing of that equipment, uh, there might be payback on that incremental efficiency. There might not be. Um, so each one, each person has to assess that kind of on their own. Um, but but basically, there's not a requirement to buy the 2023 level. But individuals may choose to do that because they prefer, you know, the operating costs of a more efficient unit. Good answer. We have another question here as to, you know, what, what sort of diagnostics 
uh, what we have on uh, these type of uh, new commercial compressors. You want to take that, take a stab at that, Jason, and I can jump in there. Um, yeah, we we do have a um, a commercial comfort alert module that can be used on these size compressors. Goes up to about the the ten horsepower size. Um, provides the the similar features to the the smaller electronics module that we sell. Um, so yeah, we have a pretty broad broad portfolio of electronics, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. and always always working on more. So stay tuned on that also. You know, one thing that I would jump in there, and uh, I would say, is, you know, uh, as an Emerson business, um, I want to say last year we made a minority stake investment in a business called Transformative Wave, and uh, they do uh, rooftop retrofits that are are um, in controls that are in cloud monitoring and the like, and so on and so forth that are uh, associated. Uh, with uh, you know optimizing the uh, the fan control as well as compressor staging and so on and so forth. Um, you know as we've been going through this, uh, there has been coordination there as we've been working with these guys. And so stay tuned. Uh, I think uh, to your question, it's a very astute question. Uh, there certainly is potential even beyond you know the various types of controls that you will see uh, that come out at the OEM level. Um, associated with two-stage compressors and the uh, controls of multiples. So I think um, I think we're getting pretty close to to wrapping up. So as we're kind of winding down, one, I want to say thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. And also, I want to offer, you know, through the Designer Air series, we've got lots and lots of great content here. Um, so please continue to check that out. Um, stay tuned. Stay tuned for, your next, uh, web, for the next webinar and so on and so forth. And also, I want to thank a few people that happened, that, that helped to make this happen. Uh, Sarah Taylor. Lindsay Hennings, great job. Helped us, you know, make sure that the deck was ready. Very good job. We we appreciate the people behind the scenes. So, anything else to add, Jason? No, I think that about sums it up. Thank you Thank very you. much. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's presentation. We'd like to thank you for your time and interest today, and you may now dismiss.